Deputy Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Cairn, again. Um, I just want to clarify a couple of pieces of evidence that we got in, in previous sessions um, in the run-up to the, the bailout negotiations. Were you aware that Governor Honahan suggested to Minister Lenehan in April 2010 that Ireland would be next for a bailout after Greece? Well, I've read that. I was, I'm not just sure that Brian told me that directly, but um, I think he was of the opinion that Portugal would be in, a position, would be in that position before we'd be in it. But my recollection of some of the transcripts, I'm trying to figure out what I'm reading from this operation and what I can recall at the time. You don't recall Mr. Lenehan passing that information on to you? No, I'm sure that was a conversation he had with the Governor where they were speculating on where, where Ireland might be, but obviously at weekly Cabinet meetings substantive discussions take place if there's an issue to be discussed rather than depending on a discussion that might take place outside the Cabinet. Okay. And were you aware that the precautionary programme from the IMF was suggested to the Governor in May 2010? that he then put this forward to the Department of Finance. Yeah, I was aware that obviously the, um, the um, governor was uh, passing on to the Department of Finance what thinking he was picking up over in the European institutions, if you like, apart from what we'd be picking up ourselves. Well, this is separate. This is the IMF ahead of a... They were coming over to do a, a country report, and they suggested to the governor that we might wish to seek a precautionary programme, one of their new precautionary programmes from them in May 2010. Do you recall that specifically being passed on to you at the time? Uh, again, you're asking me to specifically recall that. It would probably be in documentation that was, came to Cabinet at some stage, but, uh, but the point I'm making to you is, regardless of what the IMF were saying, you know, we were coming to a position in relation to our own situation to say that we would prepare a four-year plan anyway, regardless if there was never an, a European dimension to it. At what point then did the possibility or the likelihood of a bailout come into your view? Well, we knew, we knew that uh, when we were in discussions with them in September, first of all, there was this question of uh, they would be interested in the fiscal side of the equation, first of all. And in this sort of budgetary engagement that takes place between the European Commissioner, concerned Mr. Wren, and the Finance Minister of Ireland, Brian Lenehan, um, there were also some ECB people who were in on those discussions. Mr. Starr would be one of them. And, and they would always be more hot. They would sort of be saying, you know, you cut this deficit by eight billion. And we'd say, no, we don't, think, we don't think that's doable and we don't think that's right. We think, you know, we, we have other things in mind. So you start discussing that and eventually uh, it ended up with, it wasn't quite six billion, there was some, there was some one-off savings that we made that was included in that six billion might have been maybe 5.3 billion plus 700 million of a one-off benefit. Just to, to, to be clear, these discussions were with a view to having to avoid a bailout, that, well, that you could achieve these Yeah, these, well, these discussions were about us, what we were going to be doing is obviously you'd have, you'd use your relationships with the European Union to make sure that you were, um, that if we were coming forward with a, with a plan that it, they would have an understanding of what was doable and how, how the Irish government saw you closing this gap over a period rather than some desktop operation over the ECB or the European Commission coming in and telling us you have to do X, Y and Z. We were saying, you know, we have to do this. We're committed to doing it uh, and we, we are giving you an assessment as to what we think is the best way of doing it um, given, the amount, given the journey we have to travel. I might come back to that, but I just want to just briefly address the um, issue of burden sharing with bondholders before the bailout, though. Um, before the, or before, and before the end of the guarantee. So as the guarantee comes to an end in September, close to 19 billion of unsecured and senior bonds come out of the guarantee. Uh, four to five billion were bonds issued to Anglo and NBS. And between September and the bailout agreement, 2.4 billion of unguaranteed unsecured senior bonds were repaid. Um, so approaching this position, the end of the guarantee, did the government have any plans for burden sharing? Once you're still in the markets, the, 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 the thing that changed was, when, if you're still in the markets as we were up to then, <clears throat> and you're out there borrowing money, as I say, from a limited pool of investors, the question of um, being allowed to, as they call it, foreign bond, senior bondholders, uh, was not something that the NTMA would be in favour of, in terms of being 
out there getting funds at the right price. Um, you would also the situation where the ECB and the, the Monetary Authority there were not, were not in favour of burning bond holders. Is this expressly known to you before the end of the guarantee? No, I don't think. I wouldn't say it was expressly made expressly known, but it was clear what their policy was. I mean, there hadn't been a bondholder burnt since Lehman's. Even the, even the United States, who have a much more aggressive resolution program for for wind ups or banks or closing down banks or winding them up, uh, they hadn't burnt a bondholder, I think, since Lehman's either. And the reason was that the, the effect this could have on on market sentiment and. Uh, for this, well, I think the central bank was looking at the possibility of burden sharing with senior bondholders and even large depositors in August, September 2010. Well, I mean, the central bank were looking at these. We were looking to see would it be possible to do it. I mean, you wouldn't say you're not. Does it mean you're not going to try it if you, can, if you think it's the right thing to do and if it's if everyone's on the same page? So I mean, it's back to this contingency planning again. But the the issue was, as far as I could see, that um, for so long as we were out there looking for, for financing on open markets, the question of burning bondholders in the position we were in was a very difficult proposition. Once we came out, out of the markets, once we were talking about going into a program where we had three-year money um, in prospect and a, and, a, and a sort of a fiscal framework where you could plan your way through the next three years, um, you know, you weren't, I wasn't that worried about you know, the bond market, because we wouldn't be in the bond market for three years anyway, if that was the case. Is any part of the state apparatus recommending burden sharing to you at that point? Well, I know the central bank, as you're saying, were looking at it, but the NTMA had noticed at that point when we were out in the markets, my, my belief and understanding is the NTMA would not have been in favour of that. Minister of Finance? Well, the Minister of Finance would obviously work on the advice he had, and he had to make sure that he could get – we knew we had, we had big deficits to fund. It's important that we got the money to fund those deficits, to plan our way through the next three or four years. Um, and obviously he would be very much influenced by that, and the NTMA would have a fair say on that. But as I say, the situation changed once we got an, an alternative access to funds over a relatively long period of three years, when we didn't have to be going to the bond market looking for money. Well, Kevin Cardiff told us that um, the NTMA were in favour of burning bondholders if it could be forced on us by Europe, if Europe said we must burn bondholders. Um, so were we in favour of the Deauville Declaration? Well, the Deauville Declaration, I don't think did us much good because uh, I'm, I'm, in of of it, I'm in favour of it if you thought you could get something out of it now, but the problem was, which was clarified within a couple of hours, that relates to 2013 debt, new debt from then on. So that wasn't... You know, that wasn't helpful to us in the immediate situation we found ourselves in. But were we part of the thinking that led to that declaration? No, you? that declaration was very much a Franco-German initiative. It's been coming increasingly part of the process um, before council meetings, where French, and French President and the German Chancellor meet uh, and have some things to say, which I think is really about trying to reposition the Franco-German entente or alliance at the centre of European decision-making. And, and sort of suggesting that this, this is our position as we go into this meeting, however about the rest of you. I think, you know, the community method remains the best method for European decision-making as far as I'm concerned because it, it, it puts the Commission in the central role it should be of policy initiator and ensuring equal treatment for all states, including small states and large states. Governor Honohan said that after the Dover Declaration the die was cast and we were heading for a bailout and that was clear. Yes. Governor Honohan. So was that clear to you at that time, that we were heading for a bailout? Well, our official position still at that time was that we were prepared to look at various processes, including a probationary program, including a parallel program that we could take up if we needed to. Remember, we were sufficiently funded until, until uh, May or June of the following year. Now, I'm not suggesting that we would, you would wait until May or June of the following year to decide what your next, next funding mechanism was. But, you know, it was a matter for us as, democratic, as, as the democratic government to make those, to make that positioning and to do whatever leveraging we could do on our position in our interaction with the institutions. Now, clearly, the ECB, um, in the personage of the governing council of the ECB, I'm sure had a view on, on that from a monetary point of view. But, you know, we had the, 
We had a lot of considerations to consider in that. Okay. From the evidence we got from Mr Cardiff, we see a number of uh, interactions between Minister Lenehan and different officials from the ECB, the Commission and the IMF. Um, do you feel that Brian Lenehan kept you informed of developments at all times? Yes, I think Brian, Brian obviously had a, he had a very tough job and he did it very, very well. And um, he was a very capable uh, minister and um, I was very happy to appoint a minister of finance and I'm glad I did. Um, he, you know, there was a lot of balls in the air and he was trying to keep them all, but certainly as far as I'm concerned, as far as the cabinet were concerned, he would keep us informed generally. Do you, or do you feel that you misled the public, either intentionally or through omission, as to the need for a bailout at any time prior to the 21st of November, when the cabinet made the decision to apply for one? No, there was no intention to mislead, but I do, I do accept that there was a miscalculation, political miscalculation on my part and on our part. Once the IMF component of the, of the EU delegation was coming to Dublin, this idea the IMF were in town immediately created this view that it's a fait accompli. What we, what we were doing was, at the time, and that was just the situation right up to the, the meeting, I think, of the 16th on the Tuesday when Brian, was, Brian Lennon was, in, was there as finance minister for the country at an ECOFIN or a Eurogroup meeting was, he was coming under pressure, all right. People, his colleagues saying to him, you know, you need to go into a bailout program. And Brian was simply saying, well, I happen to mandate to do that. That would have to be a cabinet decision. Uh, you know, we're making progress. We're, we're discussing what, what it might look like, where we to do it. And we have, you know, legitimate concerns that we want cleared up, including on corporation tax. And we were, he said to them, in an effort to be cooperative, in an effort to be helpful and to show our bona fides, he was saying, well, no, the next meeting we can have it in Dublin. The next meeting with officials we have it in Dublin. You, you come over to us. Uh, and that sort of then became, very quickly became uh, a fait accompli as far as some people were concerned. What exactly was the miscalculation? Sorry, just to clarify. The miscalculation was agreeing to have the talks the impact, in Dublin. The impact or not having an IMF public. personnel coming over. If the EU were just coming over and we were ha having continuing consultations, I don't think it would have the same impact if you had an IMF person with them. Now, they were coming over. And... and uh, there was no intention. What we're trying to do, basically, is to, and I know that it's, it's done in a way, that it's not meant in any way to mislead, because there's no, there's no benefit in a government misleading its own people. We weren't doing that. I was, a, I was in a cabinet that did a devaluation once, and we knew about it the, the minute it was done. You know, sometimes you have to do things that way uh, to, for, for the purpose of confidentiality and for the purposes of maximizing whatever leverage you have. But the point is, in relation to this particular matter, we were simply trying to get as full a picture as we could before formally applying for a bailout as to what it would look like. And if we, because I, I can understand, you see, the political miscalculation is, you know, the negative of people saying, oh, you're, you're entering a program. But the positive was we were going to get money for a three-year period without wondering what the fluctuations in, market, in the markets are going to be. You're going to have money at a certain rate for that period to do a job which you'd set out in the four-year program, which is going to be very difficult to do anyway, but which had to be done. So the point I'm making is that um, we were, as I say, Brian was saying, I don't have a mandate to say, it's not for Brian Lennon or Brian Cowan on his own to say we're going into a program. It's a question of the Cabinet making that decision. And we were coming to the point where we were getting the necessary clarity about where they were going and what they were looking for from us that we felt was in line with what we wanted to do anyway. And the final point I'd make, not stopping you, is that when we did go into the programme, it was on the basis of a prior Cabinet decision that we were adopting our own programme. In other words, they weren't going to be imposing it on us. We had a central plank prepared and ready to do. Back a moment. On the 13th of November, you had a meeting with Brian Lenehan and its officials. And from that meeting, you say in your opening statement in paragraph 203, we had made no commitment at that point to formally apply for assistance until we were satisfied, satisfied what the authorities had in mind and the conditionality attached to it. And discussions were to take place, it would be talks about talks. Is there a reason why the two of you didn't inform your cabinet of this at the time? No, because we were still at talks about talks. This was on a Sunday morning in Sycamore Room, I recall. And it was myself and himself and a couple of officials from the Department of Finance and my own department. And we were, he was saying to me that he was having, he was having to go out to a, a, an ECOFIN meeting 
on the Tuesday. I usually go out in the Eurogroup on the Monday evening, and you have the Eurogroup meeting, or sorry, the ECOFIN meeting on the Tuesday morning. And he wanted some, he wanted line, he wanted some line of instructions as to how we were going to handle uh, the, the situation as it was developing. And I said to him, uh, he said that we're, our people are going out to have a chat with them because we have to go and talk to them. They want to talk to us. We go and talk to them. And I said, okay, that's fine, but let's keep it. At a, we're not committing. We're not pre-committing to this until we know where it's going. I'm wondering, I mean, what did the cabinet know prior to the meeting of the 16th of November, where they were brought up to speed? Because Kevin Carter talked about the guarantee being Plan B from September. So, what did the cabinet know before that point? What was, what was involved there was um, when on Monday there was an unfortunate instance where Dermot O'Hearn and, and Noel Dempsey were out at the opening of a road in Mead or Louth or Brown there, Slade or something. And they had asked for what's the story, and there was some story in the newspaper about it. And they were told, no, there's no talks going on. And they went out and just gave that simplistic position. Instead of just saying, what I would have said is, not saying what criticised them anyway, they simply said what they were told by some of the department or whatever, who didn't get the nuance of the situation at all. I just said, these are matters for, we're here up in the road, these are matters for the Minister of Finance, you better talk to him about it. But the point would be that they were, um, it was seen as if, uh, you know, they were giving misinformation, which they weren't, not as they understood, they weren't giving misinformation. Technically, we weren't in negotiations with anybody. There were discussions going on. We had not agreed to go into a programme. We had not applied for a programme. But we were in discussions about the possibility. But until we knew where that was going, we weren't even acknowledging that. Not because you're trying to mislead anyone, but you don't want the European people you're talking to to think that this is all, that you can say what you like to us and we're going to go in anyway. It's fair to say that you and the Minister for Finance have brought the state in a certain direction, almost to a decision without keeping the Cabinet fully informed? No, I don't accept that. As I said to you, I was in a devaluation. I was in the Cabinet one time in the devaluation. I was Minister of Finance, thankfully. I thought it was successfully done. But the, the then Taoiseach, Albert Reynolds and Bertie Ahern, mm. I'd say were the only two who knew around the Cabinet table when that decision was going to be taken and made it. And there are good reasons why that was done in that way. Cabinets were there when it was made, but it was being made. It was sort of ready to go at that point. Now, that wasn't the same situation here. I'm not suggesting you that that level of secrecy in this situation, but there was a, a miscommunication. There was a, a, a miscommunication that happened, and as head of the government, I should take responsibility for that. Um, again, you said you made no commitment at that point to formally apply for assistance until we were satisfied what the authorities had in mind and the condition, conditionality attached. But whether or not burden sharing would be a part of that agreement wasn't one of those conditions that you decided to clarify before entering negotiations. Is that correct? At that point, no. The burden sharing issue was not uh, a definite part of it. It was going to be, it was going to come up in the discussions in relation to the banking situation. But we're here talking about the, econo the economic program we're talking about as well. But on, on the meeting of the cabinet on the 21st of November, at which the decision was made to then formally request assistance. Um, can you outline the discussions that took place at that cabinet meeting, um, whether alternative options were considered or any uh, advice received for or against the decision? Well, again, you'll know that you know, the question of cabinet deliberations are constitutionally um, not available for, for good reason. I know that, but I am, I am going to answer it. I'm, just, okay, okay. I'm not trying to be pedantic about it. Just, no, I understand. Um, Sorry, we're talking about what date? It's the Cabinet meeting on the 21st of November when the decision was made to begin the negotiations. Yeah. Well, basically, um, on the 21st of November, we were outlining uh, where things were at. The Minister outlined where things were at at that point. Um, he informed his colleagues that preliminary discussions have taken place with the IMF, the EU Commission and the ECB. He also spoke about serious liquidity problems currently being experienced by the Irish banks again, um, the difficult budgetary situation, um, the high cost of government bonds, um, meaning to say that we have tactically stepped out of the market for the moment. Um, 
and the dangers to international stability as perceived by our partners in the European Union. And he went on to talk about those issues, um, um, and he made the point that the discussions at the European level were such that he felt we could, could and should apply for a programme on the basis that the conditionality he had gleaned from them would be consistent with where we were going ourselves as a government. The decision to enter negotiations by the Cabinet then made on the expectation that there would be burden sharing. It was the situation there was that we made a decision at that, at that um, Cabinet meeting, yes, to apply, to make the application formally. Um, Sorry, one second. It would involve, obviously, the question of bank sharing, or sorry, bank, sharing, bank restructuring. Um, to return, to return the, the banking system to long-term sustainability and viability in relation to their funding capacity. In other words, to start reducing the balance sheets. Um, of restructuring of Anglo-Irish Bank and INBS, and there was legislation would be involved in that as well, including a bank resolution regime to enable the restructuring of distressed institutions. The actual question of, of burden sharing is not, I don't see as part of the decision here at this point. Discussed or that expectation being amongst your colleagues at Cabinet? Um, the question was starting to be thought about about shifting our position, if you like, on the basis that if we get, if we, if we get a satisfactory programme and we're not dependent on the bond markets, um, can we get that burden sharing as part of a solution to the ultimate cost of what we're trying to do? It was discussed. Thank you. Just then coming to the, to the, the end point of negotiations, um, why was Governor Honan not present for the final meeting on the 26th of November, which has been described as the showdown? where the Troika staff told Brian in categorical terms that burning the bondholders would mean no programme and accordingly could not be countenanced. I don't know that offhand, you'd have to ask. Were you present? Mr. Honan himself, no. Why were you not present? Well, because I felt that the Minister of Finance should deal with that. He was the man that was dealing with them. Um, he was reporting back to Cabinet, obviously, but he wanted to deal with that matter as he has a finance people with him has been held in finance and that it be dealt with in finance. We've heard an evidence that the amount that could have been uh, burden shared was uh, 18 to 19 billion of senior, senior bonds, unsecured, unguaranteed, and that was the IMF proposal, and Kevin Cardiff confirmed this. So do you not think that you should have been in that meeting, that showdown, uh, where the issue of burden sharing was finally resolved, given its importance to the state? The question of a showdown was a question of them confirming to us what we had gleaned from our own intelligence, which was that you couldn't get um, the EU and the um, ECB on board with a suggestion from an, IF, an IMF official at the level that we were that was dealing with at the local level. He had gone to the IMF and they had rung um, their G7 or their, their top contributors and under no circumstances as far as the US Treasury Secretary was concerned, would there be, a, would there be burning of bondholders? Now, I don't have the influence to overturn a G7 type body. We just, weren't, we just weren't going to get it. Should we have been on that phone call with the G7 that decided ultimately the fate of the, 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 the IMF, conditionality? The IMF were checking with their main contributors. We're not a main contributor. Okay. And the IMF were checking with the people who fund them as to whether they were in, in favour of this or not. And it was very clear, as I said, from the US point of view, from Mr. Geithner's point of view, since they hadn't burnt a bondholder from, since laymen themselves, they were also concerned, and, and ECB, I think, were concerned too about what would happen if, if there was, from a European perspective, if there was burning of bondholders, what, what impact would that have on other countries who were lining up be possibly programme entrance, what impact would that have on access to the bond market? And therefore, they steered well away from it. Go Governor Honahan said uh, when he was before us, we never committed to not burning the bondholders. We committed to not including the burning of bondholders in the programme, 
We never signed any document that said we will never burn bondholders. So how is it understood? With what authority and on what basis was bailout conditional on the burning of bondholders? Senior unguaranteed and unsecured bondholders, and was it your intention to burn these bondholders at a future date? Well, as I say, in relation to this, I mean, at the end of the day, the government had to make a political calculation. And the political calculation had to be, do we go into this programme and have access to three-year money at this rate, with the prospect of it being reduced over time, or do we have no access to money been out of the markets at the moment uh, and take a chance? And it's back to, you know, my way of thinking is you don't take chances like that. You can't take chances like that. How would Governor Honan say that, though? That well, we Governor never Honan in? can say, you know, Governor Honan can say whatever he wants to say. I can't, I can't. I'm not here to answer for his own opinion. He's given his own view. The, it appeared he seemed to be giving the view of, of, of what the state was thinking of it. Never committed to not burning the bondholders. We committed to not including the burning of bondholders in the programme, but we never signed any document that said we will never burn bondholders. He's not talking. Okay, okay, fine, person, fine, you know. fine. He wants to make that distinction. That's fine. But the, the practical issue was that we were going into the programme on the basis that the IMF wouldn't agree to the burning of bondholders. It's the bottom line. Then finally, thank you, Chair. We come to the final decision of the Cabinet on the 27th of November. Um, and the question is really that decision that was taken, given everything that was now known about the conditions of the bailout, what would not be happening regarding burden sharing and the interest rate that was going to be applied, um, was the decision to accept the bailout as straightforward as the decision to approve the guarantee in terms of Cabinet support? Well, I mean, the Cabinet adopted it. The cabinet adopted the program, adopted the as straightforward. As well, straightforward. I mean, it's straight, well, straightforward in the sense that nothing was straightforward, Deputy. I mean, these are big decisions. They're not straightforward. You know, the Deputy the Minister of Finance puts out the position. He explains where it's at. He goes through the details of what's, in, what's envisaged, what's involved. Um, we, got, um, we got in writing um, recommendations on this from the NTMA and the Central Bank that this was something that we could run with if we had to. Um, so the question of what we're trying to achieve here is to, to, uh, to, drop, to drop the balance sheet. You know, there's pros and cons in all of this. But there's, there's no doubt at the end of the day that, see, regardless of the amount of European involvement for the moment, the amount and all the other stuff, Ireland as a country had to get to this position. We had an, an economic program that we had agreed on that would get us to that position. That economic program followed the central plank of this program to get us access to the money to implement it. Um, so in that sense, you know, we, were, we were facing up to our responsibilities. Thankfully, there was a program there which helped us to, to get through this very difficult period. Um, we had made the point, and it was clear in the, in the, in the memo, that whilst the IMF um, percentage interest is a calculation, and the, the European one, we were the first entrance into the programme, was the first new programme, they were sort of on the basis that, I think I've referred to it in my statement, on the one hand they wanted it to be affordable, on the other hand they didn't want it to be so attractive that those who were getting into trouble wanted to come into it. So, they were setting it up. It ended up basically about 5.8 composite interest rate. But we had it in the, it's in the memo and it's, it's, it's an understanding in the program that we continued, that we could continue to talk about that. We could continue to talk about this interest rate issue because we weren't exactly saying, you know, that's great. We, so, so the point is, the point is that um, we continue to work on that and as early as November and December, discussions were ongoing about that, that, that interest rate. The report of the, a member of the Cabinet saw it as the terms of humiliation. You, you'd have no time to come in. Mr. No. Cohen, sorry. sorry. No, I, don't, I don't know who quoted that. Okay, we're not going there.